Chapter 4, Medical, Legal, and Ethical Issues. First, we're going to talk about the scope of practice. Scope of practice is what EMTs and EMS providers can do based on the standards set by the state. Colorado has a Colorado EMT scope of practice. It's set by the Board of Medical Examiners and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. It's something you probably should read, be familiar with, and uh, we'll we'll look at one of those in class when we get a chance here. But it's it's the skills that you may perform based on the state. The state does not give you the right to practice medicine. That only goes through your medical director. The medical director will determine which skills you are allowed to do under his or her direction. So your scope of practice is what the state allows you to do. The standard of care is what other EMTs in your situation would be expected to do. If you do something to a patient and they think that you may have not done it by the standard of care, they will call an expert witness, usually an EMS uh, instructor, to come into court and they'll say, Mr. Instructor, you have a patient who is showing symptoms of this, this, and this. How would you treat them? And then the instructor would say, I would put to this A, B, C, and D. And they'd say, well, this, our, our plaintiff, or our defendant here, is saying they did E, F, and G. And then uh, then you have a discussion over what the scope of pra or the standard of care is based on what the the local community have perceives. So scope of practice is what you can do, and the standard of care is how you implement what you can what you're doing. Patient consent. Any patient over the age of 18 or 18 or above has the right to accept or deny care. They can consent to or disagree with parts of care, full care, or they do not want any care at all. First we have express consent. You tell me that you're going to start an IV on me and there's a potential that I could get an infection from the IV. I have been informed of my risk and I say yes go ahead and start my IV. If you tell me you're going to start an IV on me and I say purple dragons and you say it's going to be uh, kind of painful and I might get an infection and I say chicken pox, you can say uh, that I do not have the right mental status to say yes or no or we, and we would assume implied consent. It is when an, a person that is capable of applying cons or uh, capable of giving consent is not in the right mind to give that consent. So that's implied. You would assume they would want it if they were in their right mind. Children or mentally incompetent adults, somebody that uh, is normally not competent to make their own decisions. So minors uh, typically below the age of 18 are not pregnant and have not been emancipated or are members of the military. So we need to uh, kind of understand what our, our local requirements are, but if they're under the age of 18, you typically need a parent to consent for non-life-threatening treatment. If there's a life threat, we would go with implied consent. But if it's a non-life, like a broken wrist or ankle, you have to wait for consent from the uh, caregiver or the mom or dad. And those are things I just covered. Involuntary transport. Sometimes we transport people against their will. Maybe it's a court order. Maybe we got a we have a mental health professional that has given us permission to transport this patient under the state law which allows that. Make sure you're very careful on getting that permission. Make sure you're documenting everything and everybody that told you it was okay. Because if we do transport somebody that was not underneath these orders, we can actually uh, be considered kidnapping. So we want to be careful with that. But as long as you're doing what you think is best for the patient, you have fairly good protection. 
if we restrain a patient, we have to be very careful to document why we restrained them, how we restrained them, and their condition throughout the transport. A lot of times you're seeing things on uh, Facebook or uh, TikTok or other places where people were restrained inappropriately and they suffered consequences because of it. So we're very cautious about making sure we're restraining people appropriately. We will talk about that and uh, do some practice and learn how to do it correctly and how to document it correctly. When a patient needs to be treated and they do not want to be treated, we consider that a refusal of care. So to be to refuse care, they have to be able legally to consent. So they have to be over the age of eight or 18 or over, and they have to be competent, fully awake. What I do to try to maintain this is when somebody says they do not want care, I will inform them of the the risk if they don't accept that care. Say if you because just because you're having chest pain, I think you may be having a heart attack. You do not want care. If this really is a heart attack, your heart muscle could actually stop working and you go into cardiac arrest. Are you sure you're aware of this? They say yes. I say, okay, now write down what I just told you. And if they can perform that, they can write it down and make sense. I feel confident that I've clear that they understand the risk and they're competent to refuse care. So I inform them of the risk, they sign the form, and we move on. Unfortunately, there are lots of good lawyers out there, or lots of lawyers, that will attempt to take the blame back to the person that, that allowed them to go home by their own. Uh, to be released. One thing we do on our local system, if you are having somebody that needs to be uh, treated, they refused, the doctors here want to talk to them personally. So you will call in for medical control, you ask to speak to the physician, the doctor on staff at the time will ask to speak to the person, they'll talk, they'll, they'll have a, a conversation with them, explain the risk, and then they will give you their opinion whether they need to come to the hospital. There are some times the doctors will say, I don't feel like they're in their right mind. I give you my permission to bring them in. So if there is a question you document, Dr. McCoy gave me permission to bring this patient against their will. And then when they go to the lawsuit stage, if it gets to there, you have the name of the person that told you to bring them in. When a patient refuses care, do all you can. One of, the, one of the many skills you need as an EMS provider is the salesmanship. Being able to sell the person on the idea that they really need to go to the hospital. If they don't, that's fine. If you get there, I've, got, I've been in a car crash, my neck hurts because I got rear-ended, I'm not having any severe pain, you don't think I need to go to the hospital, I'm not refusing care, you don't have to worry about it. You just say, he didn't need treatment, I agree with you, and let's move on. You say, hey, I'm really concerned about you because you keep blacking out, and I say, I don't want to go to the hospital. Now you're going to take the time to try to explain to me why it's important I go. So listen to them. Why don't they want to go? Is it because they really want to watch the, the Bronco game coming up? Tell them it's not that important. It's just the Broncos. Move on. Uh, or tell them, hit the DVR. Or show them how to set up their VCR if they've still got one. Do something to try to get them to go to the hospital. Always make sure you tell them the consequences. What's what's uh, going to happen if they don't go? And then inform them if they do refuse, that doesn't mean they can't call us back if they need us. And tell them if something changes, they change their mind, hit 911, call, and we'll be right back. Like I said, sometimes we get the hold of medical direction, ask them to jump in, talk to family members. You can't tell them of all the medical conditions because of confidentiality, but you can tell them, uh, hey, your person, your family member's having a lot of problems right now. We really want them to go to the hospitals. Can you talk to them? Sometimes it helps. Sometimes it doesn't. So use what resources you have. If you need to, call law enforcement. 
If you think they're a danger to themselves, maybe law enforcement needs to be involved. And all else fails, get them to sign the documentation. Get a witness that understands what you're doing and why you're doing it. <clears throat> if you force them to go to the hospital and they are competent, you can actually be sued for assault or battery. So we want to be very careful, be mindful of what's going on. Um, and then again, tell them if they change their mind, call us back. We're here. Have someone stay with them. Somebody that can keep an eye on them just in case. And then with everything we do in EMS, documentation is key. With patient refusals, you probably should document more than any other type of care you provide. So document, document, document. Everything you did, you saw, you told the patient, things they told you, who else you talked to, so that if it ever comes back, you've got a good history of what happened. Do not resuscitate orders, uh, advanced directives, different things out there. There are a legal document expressing the wishes of the patient for what they want to do if they can't talk for themselves. Power of attorneys, living wills. Colorado advanced directive is a very specific form that is by law a order from the doctor to you as a care provider that says what you can and can't do. Now, if I want to, I can write out a do not resuscitate order, carry it in my wallet, and when you find it, you have to make that decision do you or honor it or not. With the Colorado Advanced Directive, there's no question. You find it, you have to take care, you have to do what it says. But here's the good thing. If somebody has a DNR, or advanced directive or living will, it's probably because they're in hospice and they know they've got some type of chronic illness or terminal disease and we know they're not going to get better. And you can tell by looking around their scene, the, where they are, that they're probably in that condition. I had a neighbor that had a DNR, his uh, end stages cancer, and the night he uh, fell down beside his bed his wife calls me and says hey Ken I can't get Earl up so I run over and before I even go in to check on him I said hey can you grab the DNR it's supposed to be on your refrigerator she couldn't find it the wife was frantic because she was just in that denial stage and uh, so I go in and check Earl and Earl wasn't getting up he was stiff and blue and uh, so I go back and I look for the DNR with her and we can't find it. The EMS crew gets there and they're like, we don't have a DNR. We have to do something. So guys, look at him. He's cold, stiff, blue. Here's his health care record. Here's everything about him except the DNR. What do you think? Well, you got to start something. I said, well, call your doctor. And they called and he's like, I said, well, let me talk to your doctor. And I got on the phone. I talked to him. And he's like, okay, thanks. So talks to the uh, crew. And so they, they stopped everything right then. But you just got to gotta think about it. Use some common sense. We tell families they need to keep them around. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. Now, if you get to the scene and it's a younger person and it looks like there's been a disturbance and the husband hands you a handwritten DNR for his wife who's laying in the middle of the floor with a gunshot wound, that's probably not a valid DNR. If you find the, the situation looks like I described with Earl, then you probably uh, you can probably figure that one out. So other legal issues. Negligence. Negligence is when something should have been done and it wasn't done. Or you didn't do it correctly. To prove that you committed negligence, you have to prove the EMT had a duty to act. There was some legal obligation that you provide care. It could be that you are a volunteer firefighter and you swore to protect everybody in your district 24-7, 365. Then you have a duty to act. It could be that you're in uniform sitting at Starbucks having a, a, a coffee and the guy at the counter falls over. You're in uniform, you're in your district, you're on the clock, you have a duty to act. 
if we're in EMT class and one of you goes into a medical emergency, I don't have a duty to act. I am not hired as a paramedic with UC Health. I'm an instructor. I do have a moral obligation that I would take care of you. I'd probably let students take care of you too, but I would make sure you were taken care of. That is not a duty to act, that's a moral obligation. The other thing you have to prove for negligence is a breach of that duty. You failed to provide the standard of care. Remember when we talked about they get the other EMT up there on stand and say, what would you do? This is where that standard of care comes in play. Did you do what you were supposed to? I saw on Chicago Fire where they cut a hole in a guy's neck and shoved a pen in it to get the airway open. That is not in our scope of practice or standard of care. And everybody you talk to on stand will say, I wouldn't do that. That's on TV. That's what we're talking about, breach of the duty. Or if you just didn't do anything, you just stood there and watched and you had a duty to act. You have to prove that there was a cause, a, a connection between what you did or didn't do and the suffering, the, the damages the person has. So with a cardiac arrest, I have a duty to act. I start CPR. I break their ribs. Are break, broken, broken ribs are damaged? Yes. I had a duty to act? Yes. Me pushing on the chest caused the broken ribs. So we've got our, our, our causation, our breach of duty. The problem we have with that situation, the patient was in cardiac arrest when I started, and now they're alive with broken ribs. So I didn't make them any worse off. They are actually better. They're alive with broken ribs versus dead. So there's not a harm to the patient. Yes, broken ribs are, are painful, but they're alive now. One thing that uh, does help protect us as EMTs is that when lawyers go looking for negligence, they're looking for dollar signs, and EMTs don't have a lot of dollars. I would recommend you get a uh, some type of liability protection, some type of insurance. There, it's not very expensive for EMTs. It's like twenty or thirty bucks a year. But it's, it gives you that peace of mind knowing you're protected up to $3 million, I think, is what I've got on mine. So it uh, gives you a little extra protection there. Usually lawsuits are just uh, <clears throat> something they're looking for information to get to somebody else. So it's very important to document everything you did. They're going to call you into court and basically have you testify somebody against somebody else. Duty to act, we talked about. It's an obligation to provide care. Know your legal obligations and your moral obligations. I was coming back from... Years ago, we had a bottle or a glass bottle soda machine in our ambulance station, and there was only one bottler in the state that provided that kind of glass Coke bottles. So once a month, I would take an ambulance drive to this bottler, pick it up, fill it full of Coke bottles, and drive it back. One day I stopped on a car crash on the way back because I was in an ambulance, I'm in uniform, and I can't just drive by the scene of a crash. Stop there. Officer's like, hey, can you just take the patient in your ambulance? I said, no, it's full of Coke. His ears perked up, and I had to explain to him it was Coca-Cola. But I did my duty to act. I stopped. I just couldn't transport because I didn't have the capabilities. So know, know your responsibilities. Another term we have with duty to act is abandonment. Once you start care, you cannot degrade the patient's care or leave them alone. That's considered abandonment. I get to the hospital. They're all busy. I leave the patient on the cot in the hall without telling anybody. I didn't leave them with any care. So I get in trouble. If I'm as a paramedic, I stop to take care of a patient and a BLS ambulance shows up with just EMTs, I cannot leave the patient in their care if they need a paramedic. Now, sometimes we do transport BLS ambulances even if there's paramedics around because they do not need a paramedic. Broken ankle, no need for pain meds, 
no need for a paramedic. The patient can go with just EMTs. But you, you have to make those decisions. If you leave them with a lower care or no care, it's considered abandonment and there is legal repercussions for that. If you are off duty, no duty to act, and you start taking care of a patient, you're considered a Good Samaritan. Colorado's Good Samaritan law is very, very uh, detailed and very thorough. It covers most everything you're going to run into as long as you don't have a duty to act and you're doing what you are supposed to do, you're covered. If you do something outside of your scope, you try something that's not legal or not in your uh, standard of care, then you're going to be held liable. Confidentiality. We've all heard of HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. We have confidentiality laws all over the place. You can't share information unless necessary. So a patient's history, condition, anything, the personal identifiable characteristics, you cannot share around outside of the patient care continuum. So the privacy rule for the, the anybody that bills insurance is called HIPAA. Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. You can only share information as the patient care flows. So I can share information with the hospital. The hospital can share it with the rehab. The rehab can share it with the long-term care. Long-term care can't call me at the EMS office and say, hey, this is what happened to your patient. There's no need for the patient care to flow that way. So you get hopefully you get that the patient care flow. <coughs> if they need information outside of that care, they have to subpoena it. I, I one time I worked as the medical record custodian for the Colorado Springs Fire Department. I got subpoenas probably three, four times a week. So every Monday I would show up to the the court with the records that were being subpoenaed, I'd have to go up in front of the judge and say, judge, these are the records that are they're, they're requesting. We ask you to verify that they are what they're actually wanting and give me permission to break HIPAA confidentiality. And uh, the judge would look at it, say, yes, that's the record we wanted and give it to the attorney. And then we'd do it all over for the next one. So I'd spend a couple hours in the courtroom every Monday sharing records with attorneys or the judge saying, yeah, that's not what you're looking for that you don't have to share that with them. So, other medical uh, devices here. Medical alert bracelets, very important. Find these, use them if you can find them. People also carry, have information on their watches, on their phones. I think both of my phones have the medical alert on them. My watch has a medical alert on it. I also carry uh, a paper in my wallet of my medical information. Some people have USB bracelets that they wear that have medical information on them. So you got lots of opportunities. Sometimes it's very important information. Sometimes it just says delete browser history. So it's, it kind of depends on what you want to put on there, how important they are. Special situations you're going to run into. Uh, they're going to have ne necklaces, bracelets, cards, could say they have a heart condition, they have an implanted defibrillator. That's important to know. Any specific allergies, specifically medications that you may give them in emergency. Maybe they're a diabetic, and th this will help you determine if they need to have any sugar or anything like that. Uh, the epilepsy, if they have seizure disorders. Other uh, medical information you're going to want to know is organ donors. If you find out they've got an organ donor card, very important to pass that on to the hospital because that, that's something they've decided and their family's decided is going to kind of prolong their gift of life. I, I, it's really uh, kind of nice when you, as an EMT, you, you don't save the person, but their family makes the decision to go ahead and donate their organs and then they send you a copy of the letter the, the eyes went to give two people sight. Uh, the skin helped this many burn victims. Their heart went to a two-year-old. 
the the lungs went to this person and, and all kinds of information like that that kind of makes you feel like they did some good even the the last thing they did in life was give life to other people so it's important to make sure you find that information because they need to get that process going as quick as possible something else you've got to uh, be aware of are the safe haven laws in Colorado you can drop off a child or infant at a fire station police station or an ambulance and just no questions asked the child has to be under three days old I believe before the, uh, to be legal and I tried a 16 year old once and they wouldn't let me leave him there but um, it's the, the goal is to get the pay the child into some safe care even if the child's over the three days old and they wanted you to take care of them take the child protect them they, it happens at fire stations a lot uh, you you have to give the pay the child to somebody you can't just leave them at the doorstep but once they get them inside then they they take care of them so it's something really important good good law to have out there keeps the kids from being abandoned or even worse crime scenes you will be called to crime scenes hopefully you know it's a crime scene before you get there so try to avoid going into those if there is a crime scene limit the number of people that go in what you're going to want to do is document everything you can everything you see here and say and make sure everybody knows what's going on so first thing is very important make sure the scene is safe do not go in if it's not safe <coughs> no evidence don't touch anything don't move anything don't step anything every step you take you leave trace evidence too so try to limit the number of people look for the condition of the scene what did you see when you walked in where was everything where was the body where was the weapon where was any blood stains did you see anything out of the ordinary where was the patient laying look for fingerprints or boot prints don't step in them and then do not add anything to the scene if the patient is obviously dead leave them alone if you do need to save their life save a life that is not a question you will not get in trouble for disturbing a scene to save a life but just remember the more you contaminate the scene the harder it is for them to find the person that did the problem or did the crime and prosecute them so be careful with evidence remember what you touched what you moved where you moved it to we had a presentation at the stadium as conference by a crime scene investigator a couple years ago and he had a crime scene that he was confident it wasn't suicide but the evidence he didn't he didn't know until a few days later had been moved by the EMS crew to get to the person and so it looked like the gun was in a position that it was suicide that determination changed some of the life insurance uh, responsibilities so it was very important for them to document where things were and how they move things around as EMTs we're going to run into things that we need to be aware of to report to the authorities Colorado EMTs are mandatory reporting for any type of abuse you have to tell law enforcement you have to make sure law enforcement is notified let me put it that way most of the time if there's any type of abuse going on law enforcement is dispatched to the scene with you if it's a person 10 years or younger it's automatic in El Paso County and Colorado Springs you will get law enforcement uh, elderly it's you have to ask for it unless the, the the dispatch picks up on some type of abuse but make sure they're there if you don't have them at the scene you can always have them uh, meet you at the hospital the doctors have mandatory reporting too another thing we're seeing a lot more of is human trafficking if you have young females or males that just don't make sense they look older than they are they're being treated different they're branded consider there might be a possibility of human trafficking and 
bring the authorities in on this. Uh, any type of gunshot wounds, stab wounds, sexual assaults, always make sure you have law enforcement involved. If you need to restrain the patient, more and more law enforcement is not willing to jump in on this one. You need to do it as a medical restraint so they don't hurt themselves. Uh, if they are a violent patient, they're not a patient. If they can fight you, let them, let them leave. If they want to run, don't chase them. But if they are medically incompetent and they are having an episode where they need to be restrained for their own safety, then that's a situation where we can actually restrain them. Intoxicated with injuries, they can't take care of themselves, mentally incompetent, know your protocols. We'll go over how to find the El Paso County protocols and how to use those in class. Other things we need to worry about. Morality. Personal opinions on right or wrong. What if your personal opinion from right or wrong differs from your patient? It doesn't matter. Theirs is their decision. Yours is your decision. You are an EMT. You're hired. You've, you've chosen to help everybody at all times. So we don't judge people. Uh, we treat everybody as equals. We take care of them, we save them, and then we worry about our personal beliefs later. Sometimes that's going to push you. Uh, there are times that you get a patient that you're like, I really don't care if they die or not uh, because of what they've done. I, I transported a guy that got wounded in a shootout with law enforcement and killed two law officers. Most people really didn't care whether he lived or not. But we did save him, so he could go to trial, and he got put on death row. So it was it all comes around. <coughs> Ethics you're going to have to worry about. What's what would you do if nobody else was watching? So be honest. Do not lie in a report. Do not make if you make an error, admit it. If you did something wrong, tell something. Do not restrain people uh, in a way that's going to hurt them. Recent case out of Aurora, I guess a couple years ago, where they used chemical restraints on a patient and gave a patient that was 110 pounds, I believe, enough ketamine for a patient that was 250 pounds. That is wrong. That, that's a bad dose. So now uh, everybody's being looked at on chemical restraints. Same thing with uh, physical restraints. If you do what you think is best for your patient, having the uh, thought process, this is what I'd want done for me if I was in this situation or done for my parents, everything should come out right for you. Respect to the, the right of your patient to make their own decisions. It's their life. Maybe you have a different opinion. Maybe you have suggestions that they should do to get themselves better. That's good. Talk to them. Treat everybody fairly and justly. We went on a call one time that I recognized the address of the Grand Dragon of the local KKK. Or the lead, I can't remember his title. He was the, he was the leader of the local KKK K chapter. My partner, Rodney, big African American guy, six foot four. I said, Rodney, I know who this is. I explained it. said, I'm willing to take the patient this time if uh, you're okay with that. And he goes, No, I think he needs a little brown loving. And we walk in, the guy's eyes got huge when he saw Rodney come in his house. Rodney treated him with the best respect possible, treated him right, and took care of him. So, you got you got to take care of everybody. Help people learn what you do. Uh, if somebody does something wrong, don't cover it up. If you made a mistake, you got to admit it. If they don't admit their own mistake, you've got to make sure you tell somebody. And then don't do research on your own. That's, don't go cowboy on us. 